This is the Skoda Enyaq IV, an electric SUV, a state of sorts with a declared range of more than 500 kilometers. I'll put it to the test in the city and more importantly on the motorway. So let's get this check party swinging. IV in the ENIAC is an acronym Skoda adds to its PHEVs as well as EVs. Apparently it stands for Intelligent or Innovative Vehicle. The ENIAC is Skoda's first EV built on the new VW Group MEB platform designed specifically with EVs in mind. Before we go for a test drive, let's talk size and practicality. The Skoda ENIAC is slightly larger than the Mazda CX-5 or the VW ID.4, but also slightly smaller than the Skoda Kodiak or the Mitsubishi Outlander. The ENIAC's closest rival is the Hyundai IONIQ 5. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I'm not a fan of VW ID or Skoda ENIAC design, but I understand the designers focused on aerodynamics and making the best use of internal space, rather than making the cars look particularly interesting. As far as I'm concerned, points for the looks go to the IONIQ 5. However, Volkswagen and Skoda don't make silly mistakes like placing the reversing camera exactly in the place where you would expect to find the boot release button. <clears throat> Hyundai. By the way, you can also open the boot with gesture, which may or may not work today because we've been doing several takes and um, the car said no more. But anyway, theoretically you could, and that's despite this car having a tow hitch, an option, of course, but it does have a tow hitch and you can tow up to one ton in the rear-wheel drive version or up to 1.2 tons in the all-wheel drive version. In the tailgate you will find an ice scraper, which usually lives under the fuel filler door in the internal combustion engine Skodas. Since you charge your EV with the flap open, someone could borrow the ice scraper and forget to put it back. The boot volume is 585 liters, fold the rear seats and you get 1710 liters and almost flat loading area, almost because there is a hump which you can get rid of by raising the floor in the deep end. This is not the only practical feature, Skoda left some storage under the floor for things like Velcro cargo arrangement system or charging cables and you'll even fit the load cover under the floor. There are also large shopping bag hooks and levers to release the backrests, however, these don't fold completely, you have to give them a push. I carry a large case with all my gear and I often use it to show you how big or small the boot is. I have a feeling the Skoda designers watched film crews and they decided this is the size they are aiming for. Well, it fits even on its side, so I could probably get four or five of these in here. For this big a car, I would expect a bit more space, maybe like in the Hyundai Ioniq. This is adequate for this size of a car. There are large door pockets, cup holders, which are not large, but there are some. There is a ski hatch. And here we have AC, third zone climate control, heated seats, USB-C ports and a 230 volt socket. And all of these things are optional obviously. And like in the ID4, also here the designers tried their best to mask the thick floor. As a result, the doors cover the sills but only partially because at the bottom there is more plastic cladding exposed to the elements. Also in the front, you can feel something's not right. At 161 centimeters, the ENIAC is about as high as the BMW X4. So you expect getting in like in an SUV, but you end up sitting like in a sedan or a hatchback. You will get used to it eventually, but it's something I often encounter in EVs. The driver gets a very modest display. Skoda decided to incorporate it in the dash rather than keeping it on the steering column like in VW ID cars. But the data displayed is the same, speed, driver aids and sat-nav. More information is on the huge 13-inch central display. The first time I sat in the ENIAC, I was overwhelmed with how big this tablet is. I would prefer to have more information and a slightly larger display in front of the driver and have a smaller display here, but okay. This is largely the same infotainment system as in the ID models with several updates. So it's 
less user unfriendly, I would say, or maybe I just gave up and started getting used to new VW infotainment. By the way, one of the updates happened while I was on the go. I stopped at the lights and both screens went out and the system rebooted. How do I know it was an update? After the system rebooted, the phone icon moved here from here to here and here we now have the heated steering wheel icon something that wasn't available before in order to find out whether the heated steering wheel is on or off besides touching it of course you would have to go into the climate control menu and there you would have the icon with three stages so now you know because it's also here so even if you're not in the climate control menu here it is under the display are the air vents which blow air into your elbow. Below are some physical buttons which should be higher. At the bottom of the center console is the phone cubby with USB-C ports and an optional wireless charger. Then there are adjustable cup holders on the small side and no longer simply clever open my bottle with one hand type. On the center tunnel there is also another cubby maybe for your glasses and a tiny gear selector without park mode. In order to go into park, you have to pull the electric parking brake toggle or turn the car off with the stop-start button on the steering column. The armrest storage, as well as the glove box, are generous size, door pockets are deep and lined with soft material. Like in the ID models, also the ENIAC turns on as soon as you get in the car with the key. I don't think I need to convince anyone that EVs get good range around the town. If you're careful, you'll get maybe 600 kilometers out of the ENIAC 80 in the urban cycle. That means using around 13 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Things get a bit more complicated when you decide to go somewhere on the motorway and there is not as much opportunity to use regenerative braking and you have to deal with increasing drag. Now, the following experience is my experience in Poland in late 2021. If you live somewhere with good EV infrastructure or you never drive your EV further than a quarter of your real life range from home, that's fine. But there are people who would like to know how far you can really go in an EV with claimed range in excess of 500 kilometers. Spoiler alert, not quite as far. My goal was to reach a fast charger 340 kilometers away from home I unplugged a fully charged preconditioned ENIAC early in the morning to find the estimated range to be just 376 kilometers. Satnav was showing 3 hours and 10 minutes to my destination. The temperature outside was 6 degrees Celsius. An hour later, my range was equal to the distance remaining to my destination and it went downhill from there. The motorway speed limit in Poland is 140 km per hour. I turned the cruise control down to 130, 120, 110 and then I knew I needed to recharge before my destination. Not a problem if you have chargers along the way. However, in Poland, chargers are not marked and rarely in rest areas along the motorway. A detour for just a 10 minute and seven kilowatt hour squirt of energy cost me half an hour in total. And this was enough to make it to my destination with just 6% charge left. The charger at my destination was a 350 kilowatt hour, very rapid charger, so the ENIAC could charge with full speed. Depending on the battery size and spec, the ENIAC can charge at 50, 100 or 125 kilowatts. And guess what? 50 is standard and you have to pay extra to get the 100 or 125 kilowatt charging. Simply clever, no? I was back at 80% in just half an hour, but I waited the whole hour to charge to full. I then drove around the city of Poznań for half a day, with the range increasing, so I thought it could be possible to return to Warsaw without recharging along the way. I would just have to drive slowly. Unfortunately, on the way back there was strong headwind and after about 100 kilometers I knew I will not make it to my home safely regardless of the speed. So I had to make a charging detour 130 kilometers away from home. And yes, next to my measly 90 kilowatt CCS charger was a bunch of Tesla superchargers and I don't like Tesla. I think Tesla cars are badly made appliances, but I have to hand it to Elon Musk providing and controlling the charging infrastructure makes the customers turn a blind eye to everything else about Tesla. 
I wasted another hour or so because I had to wait for an ID3 to finish charging. The total trip time both ways was around 9 hours instead of 7. On the motorway, you can assume the ENIAC will do half the claimed range. Along the way, beside the crazy fast range drop, I also noticed the voice assistant Laura wakes up every time I say OK something, rather than specifically OK Laura. It is possible to turn the voice activation off. On the plus side, despite Android Auto navigation running, Skoda Satnav was running in the background and warning me of congestion and detours ahead. Another positive is good soundproofing. Just remember, acoustic glass is also optional. And also optional is the driver aids package with travel assist. And travel assist in this car had a bad couple of days and it would just flash errors every now and then. But regardless of that problem, I get the feeling Skoda was ordered to dumb down the active lane assist feature to stay like below VW. The Enyaq barely kept in its lane on its own and the warning chimed too often. And I understand this is not a fully autonomous car, but Octavia and Superb have better travel assist. Or, I don't know, maybe it was the wind and the Enyaq, well, it weighs well over two tons. So there's a lot to deal with here. At least the Enyaq is comfortable and that's even on the optional 21 inch rims. I'd skip the adaptive suspension and drive modes. At least DCC doesn't knock like in most VW group cars. The Skoda Enyaq iV80 has 204 horsepower and rear-wheel drive, claimed 0 to 100 km per hour time is 8.7 seconds, all-wheel drive adds 60 horsepower and shaves more than a second off the 0 to 100 km per hour time. I checked and my rear-wheel drive 80 was able to do 0 to 100 km per hour in 8.4 seconds in normal mode. Strangely, in sport mode, it took 8.9 seconds. The Enyaq is also very maneuverable, the turning circle is just about 10 meters, just like in the Skoda Fabia. It's a shame the 360 camera is an option even on such an advanced car. And the Enyaq is not cheap. Add a few options and you're in the 50s. Sure, you can get a base spec, but having to pay for 125 kilowatt charging is below the belt. And even 125 kilowatts is ridiculously slow these days. It seems nobody in VW Group beside Porsche got the memo we're in the third decade of the 21st century. Price of the Skoda Enyaq start at 33,800 euro for the 50 model with up to 362 kilometer range. The Enyaq 60 with 412 kilometers range starts at 38,850 and the Enyaq 80 with 534 kilometers range starts at 43,950. The Enyaq 80X all-wheel drive with 496 kilometers range starts at 47,000. This test Skoda Enyaq IV80 with options costs around 56,000 euro and that still leaves many option boxes unticked. The Skoda Enyaq IV is, in my opinion, the best electric VW currently on the market. It's not cheap, but with incentives and access to charging infrastructure, this could be your next EV. And how do you like the Skoda Enyaq? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching. And I will see you in the next one.